same scripture reading for today will be Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. Well, to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are the, for you tithe men and deal that deal and commend and I neglect the later promises of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done with the, without neglecting the others. All right, thank you, parents. So before I get started, I do want to call out something Troy said this morning. Uh, when he said, you know, we follow the example of the early church from the Bible and uh, not treating Easter as a special day. There's one downside to that, and that's if you put a sign-up sheet in the back for people to sign up and uh, teach on the day, and you don't label Easter, then somebody may sign up and find out that it's Easter later on. <laughs> so, anyways, it worked out well. Uh, today I was planning on talking about sacrificial giving. And I don't think there's any better day than today uh, to do that. Um, so I do have a proper three-point lesson, uh, as I keep hearing that we're supposed to do. Uh, also, uh, as a software engineer who loves repeating patterns, uh, each part will have its own three parts. And each of those three parts will have three main points. Uh, so for those of you doing the math here, that's three to the third, which is 27 points. Also, uh, since 10 is the number of completeness that we learned from Steve's Revelations thing, uh, I gave three bonus points to uh, round it out to 30. So there's three points complete uh, in all that we do. Uh, so first, the Old Testament. Uh, what do we give in the Old Testament? So the Old Testament obviously talks about tithing, right? Tithe, tithing, and even more tithing. So the first tithe comes from the Levites. Uh, Numbers 18.24 says, For the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. So the first tithe, 10%, went to the Levites uh, to support the ministry. The second tithe is the tithe of feet. Uh, this one's talked about in Deuteronomy uh, 14. Um, I'll read 22 through 23. There is more to it than that. Uh, but it, it says here, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year, and before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. So that's the tithe of feet. Also, there was a tithe for the poor. Um, I will read... Uh, oh, no, I, don't know here. I didn't bring it up. Uh, so I, I won't read it, but uh, I will talk about it here. So there was a tithe for the poor. Uh, it's the every three years, uh, they were to gather a tithe, uh, and they were to use that to give to the needy, uh, the poor, uh, widows, um, orphans, right? So that was the third tithe. And one key point to take away from that is there's three tithes, one of them once every three years. So if you average that out across three years, they were expected to give 23.3% of everything that they earned, right? So when we, we talk about the tithing of the Old Testament, they weren't just giving 10% of their income. They gave a lot more than that. Uh, it was just 10% for each one of those occasions. So, how uh, were they giving in the Old Testament? So, uh, I had just read uh, in Deuteronomy 14.22 about how it happened every year as they harvested, right? So, it was as they earned it, they harvested, they did the tithe. Uh, it was also a perpetual thing. Uh, Numbers 18.23 uh, talks about perpetually uh, doing it, that it's constant and forever. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next point here. So, additionally, uh, it was 
poor need on a regular basis, right? So this was the, the every third year one. Um, Deuteronomy 26, 12, and 13. <clears throat> I do have it on this one. All right. Uh, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, <clears throat> which is the year of tithing, give it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion out of my house, and moreover I have given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, according to your commandments that you have commanded me. And I have not transgressed on any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. Uh, and then the last one, uh, I would say, from the Old Testament, was it was still freely and of their own choice. So they did have the law, and it said that they were supposed to do it. But before the law, both Abram and Jacob uh, tithed. They, they both, uh, in Genesis, um, said that they would set aside a tithe, a 10% of what was given to them by God. <clears throat> so why? Uh, so the first tithe we just talked about was to support the church. Right? That's why they gave 10%. The second one was to fellowship with believers. That was the, the feast, the tithe of peace. And the third is to support the needy, right? The poor, widowed, and orphan. And then the bonus uh, that I have for this section is self-benefit. Uh, along with everything that, that we've talked about, uh, Proverbs 11.24 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Right? So there, there's a benefit to giving to you. And then also, uh, I don't believe I could do this sermon without uh, Troy getting upset if I don't go to his favorite verses here in Malachi. Uh, Malachi 3, starting verse 8, says, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Uh, I do want to make one point here where it says, put me to the test. Uh, I did a little bit of research on this. This is the only place in the Bible where it tells us that we should test God in this way. So the, the Hebrew for this one is naka, which is uh, to test or tempt, right? So there's two other main places that I'll talk about that use that word. One was when God allowed Satan to tempt Job, right, to test Job. Uh, it uses the same Hebrew word there. And then the other one uh, comes from Deuteronomy 6.16, where it says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. So this is one place where he's explicitly calling out, you know, we're not supposed to test him, and yet he calls out, you can test me on this. I will still open up the heavens and, and pour down blessings on you. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, the, the only other types of testing I could find uh, used a different route. It was Bacon, which is the, the kind of testing that uh, you do uh, to test, like, the purity of gold. Right? And it's used to, to test like the purity of your heart and your faithfulness uh, when it talks about testing. So, New Testament. Again, exact same point. Uh, you'll notice the theme as we run through it. Uh, so, what do we give in the New Testament? Uh, so, first off, tithing. Uh, as, you read, as you heard in the scripture reading, right, uh, Jesus explicitly said uh, you know, that they were tithing mint, basil, cumin, you know, things of, of value, uh, and yet they had neglected weightier things. And then at the very end, he still says, you should have done these other things while not forgetting your tithe. But not only are we supposed to give a tithe, right? So um, 2 Corinthians 9.17 Right, it is saying we're not supposed to just give 10%. We're supposed to give what's in our heart. Right, so that may be 10%. It may be a little less. It may be a little more. Uh, and then, also, we're not just giving money and a certain percentage. But what we should be giving 
uh, should be a sacrifice to us. There should be some cost to us to be more pleasing to God. Um, right? So I, I'm going to read that one. Mark 12, uh, 41 through 44. Uh, you're probably familiar with the story. It says, uh, And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. And then Hebrews 13, 16 uh, also says, Do not neglect to do good. Share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Right, so we're supposed to give a sacrifice, and those are pleasing to God. So how do we give? First uh, Corinthians 16.2 says, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. So just like in the Old Testament, we collect as earned. We are supposed to give cheerfully, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one of you must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we are to give in secret. Uh, Matthew 6, 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. So why do we give? So again, we give to support the church. This is uh, the same as in the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, going back to 1 Corinthians 16, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so, al- so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredited by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So, carrying it back to Jerusalem, again, to support the church. Uh, It also demonstrates a faithfulness and trust in God. Excuse me. So, uh, Matthew 6, 25-33 starts with, Therefore, uh, as we talked context last week, uh, anytime you see the word therefore, you should uh, go back and see what it was there for. So I'll uh, go back one verse, and the, the verse before it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay, so in this context, we're talking about serving God and money. You can't do both. You should serve God, not money. So starting again back at uh, verse 25, it says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, could add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Right? So this is calling us to put our faith in God, right? We're not to trust our money or the things that we have, right? We can give that away, and we know that when we need it in the future, 
that God would be there to provide for us. So if we give what we have, we don't have to worry about the future. We just need to put our trust and our faith in God to take care of us for that. And then, lastly, why do we give? To support the needy, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. So, Matthew 19.21, uh, this is the, in the story about the rich man who had kept all of the commandments and asked Jesus what he still lacked. Uh, and Jesus said to him, Sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. So, notice in that verse, he said, and give it to the poor. He didn't say give it to the religious establishment. Right? He didn't say give it to us, you know, him and the disciples, so that they can continue their work. To give it to the poor. So while we are to continue to give to the church and to help out there, we're also being called to give to those in need. And then, of course, the bonus is self-benefits again. Uh, Matthew 6.4 says, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Right? So when we're giving, God will reward us for it. And then Luke 6.38, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. <clears throat> All right, so practical application. So what does it mean for us now? Are we just giving money? Well, yes, we already give money. Uh, Mark 12, uh, 41 through 44, we, we just talked about earlier. That was the story of the widow that put in her, two, her last two coins. It was all she had to live on, right? So clearly, we're still supposed to be doing that. Jesus was happy about that being done. But we do give more than that. Right? So Matthew 25, 35, 36 says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So in this example, we can see giving food, giving our time, giving clothing. Right? So we are to give what we have that others need. And then, what are we giving? We are giving a sacrifice, right? We are supposed to give a sacrifice in faith to please God. Do not neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So, how are we supposed to give? Uh, so, give um, as you have received. You should be giving. So, Given money that could help the church or somebody in need, well, you should be giving money. Do you have spare time where you can help somebody in need when somebody reaches out? Right? Do you have skills that could help somebody? All of these are examples of giving that you can give and make a sacrifice that pleases God and helps out others. And now as we, we come to the end, uh, the perfect example we have, Jesus gave up everything to come to the earth. Right? So that was the sacrifice that he made in giving to us. He then gave up everything on earth to sacrifice himself for the needy. And in this case, the, the needy are all those who needed salvation, which is all of us. Jesus was rewarded for his obedience for following God's will. Now, in Revelations, it talks about Jesus sitting on the right hand of God uh, at the throne. So, as a bonus... Will you accept the self-benefit? Are you ready to confess your sins and give up your life to live for Jesus? If you are, can you make your intentions known uh, as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation?